Miriam. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار As it's been announced we're going to deal with very important topic as it relates to the everyday life of the Muslim, and that is what can be said and taught concerning the adab of the masjid. And when we talk about the etiquettes of the masjid, how to behave, what to do, what not to do, what's haram, what's mustahab, what's makro, then we should know this is a wide subject. This is not a 45-minute subject. And the delil for that is the fact that the masjid has been mentioned in many ayahs of the Qur'an. The masajid during the Prophet's time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and ahkam of the masajid during the times of the people who went before us. And it's also been mentioned extensively in the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And you find in all of the books of al-fiqh, all of them, there's going to be a chapter dealing with the ahkam of the masjid. In all of the books of al-hadith, you're going to find the chapter in there, especially the kutub sitta, that were put together on a way of getting fiqh. You're going to find in there the hadith about the ahkam of the masajid. So the masjid is an integral part and it plays an important role in the life of the Muslim. Muslims who don't have a masjid, there's something wrong with them. They're like, something's wrong. This is why we have to praise and we have to acknowledge what the first generation Muslims did when they came here. Although they came with khurafat, many of them came with shirkiyat, some of them bid'a and kufr even. The dawah of Hazir Nazir, Rasulullah knows the ilm al ghaib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's kufrun billahi. I don't say those people are kuffar, but that's kufrun billahi. To say that the Nabi knows everything, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
is takweeb to the kitab and the sunnah. He doesn't know everything. Anyway, the first generation Muslims who came here, one of the first things they did was they built masjids all over Europe. And that's because that's what Muslims have to do. That's the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After making hijrah from Mecca all the way to al Medina, he sallallahu alayhi wa first thing he began was to build the masjid. Because the masjid rep represents the focal point of the life of the Muslim with the people of the past. So the shahid of the kalam, and I have to mention this, some of our masajid and the way that they're being run is backwards. They help to cultivate and to create and to foster extremism because our youngsters can't relate to the cultural Islam that is being taught in those masjids. So those brothers and sisters of our community who are trying to move Islam forward into the future based upon the dawabit of al-Islam, the correct qawaid of al-Islam. Not let's move into the future in a liberal way and do anything however we want to do it, but let's do it the way it has been commanded in the kitab and the sunnah. People are like that. When you're trying to build your community and raise your community up and get away from the cultural Islam, like only Somali language is being spoken in the masjid for khutbahs and for the durus, like only Urdu, only Arabic. But the vast majority of the people, they don't understand that. Our youth, they don't understand that. So let's give them a khutbah that they understand. So in this masjid in particular, another masjid, we got rid of the old way to move forward and to meet the challenges that are facing us, as we mentioned last week in the khutbah al Jummah. I'm going to bring to the attention of brothers and sisters who have this fikr that we have to move into the future and leave that old home, old country mentality behind. We should never forget what our elders did and that they started these masajid. And right now, many of us are more educated than them. We have better jobs than them. We have more money. But we don't build mischiefs like they did. So from the hikmah of Allah is, just as he made the companions, رضي الله عنهم, around the Prophet wasallam, Allah knew that they were the people who had to be around the Nabi in order for this religion to go forward. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, رضي الله عنهم. Allah also knew because he is Al-Hakim Al-Alim, that the first generation of Muslims who came here should not have been the people who are the younger generation, because we're stingy as it relates to the masjid. Our elders, they came, and they put their money down, and they built these masjids all over this country, all over this country. And again, it's because the masjid is part of the life of the Muslim. He finds that he has to be connected to the masjid in some shape, form, or fashion. So as a result of that, this religion dealt with everything. So the issue of the masajid and the ahkam of the masajid, they have been mentioned. It is a wide topic, a broad topic. Not a topic you just come on Friday night, one time in your life, and that's it. No, you have to go and you have to read and get fiqh about this issue. Become a person who is mutafaqihun. You have fiqh. You know how to sit in the masjid and how not to sit. You know, can you eat in the masjid, can you not eat in the masjid? You know, is it permissible for you to take out your charger and plug it in the masjid's kahroba? Can you do that? Or is it something you just don't ask the question? I'm just going to do it. All of that has been covered in our religion. There was no electricity during the time of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we have in our religion what will help you to understand you should not be using the electricity of the masjid unnecessarily. Because the masjid, it is a waqf, a waqf. You see these mushafs that are here? And it says property of the masjid, a waqf. You can't come and take one of those mushafs, mushaf, pick one up, put it in your bag, you got home, you saw property of the masjid, you have to get that book back to Allah's house. It has ahkam, this masjid. Things you do and things you don't do. And if the father doesn't know, how in the world is his son going to know? The mother doesn't know, how in the world is, are the children going to know? So we have the companions, Radwan Allah alayhim, dealing with their children, being in the masjid. 
You have some of these Muslims who want to make it haram for the kid to come to the masjid and use fabricated ahadith. Then you have the other extreme of those people who bring their kids to the masjid and they are going wild in the masjid. Al-Islam addressed all of those issues. The permissibility of bringing your children to the masjid. The permissibility of bringing a enemy of Islam who was caught and tying him up in the masjid as an asir, a captive. There are ahkam about this. The point here is, how are we going to know if we don't read about it, if we don't get a tafakkur in this particular issue? It's an important issue. So we're not going to complete it in one day. No. What we're going to do, inshallah, when they ask me to take charge of this particular issue, in all honesty, I was going to do the ahkam of the masjid on the Tuesday class because it's an ongoing class and there are many things to cover. But the schedule has been shuffled and shifted. So I'm only going to have a Wednesday class, inshallah. So I'm going to keep that as our book, as Shama'il al muhammadiyah But I was going to do this class extensively. Many things we need to know about the masjid. I gave the khutbah today in Lincolnshire, out there past um, Manchester. And in the masjid, a brand new masjid, you go to give the khutbah for the Eid, for the Friday, and you'll find people don't know the ahkam of the masjid as it relates to Friday. They don't know the ahkam of the masjid as it relates to the dubs. They don't know the ahkam of the masjid as it relates to us coming together. Like the companion Abu Thalaba al Khushini said, radiallahu anhu. He said that we were traveling outside with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He stopped to take a rest. When everybody rested, some of the people went over there, some of the people went over there, some people went over there. He stuck his head out of the tent. He saw the people over all, all over the place. He said to the people, Mali Arakum Izim, Inna Tafarrukum Fihadi Sha'ab Lamin Shaitan. He said, Why are you people all over the place like this, dispersed and divided? He said, This is from the Shaitan. The narrator by these said, Every time we came together, especially in the masjid, we would come together. To the point if you threw the blanket out over the people, it wouldn't hit the earth. Meaning from the etiquette of the masjid and a dust like this, it's not to sit back there. It's not to sit back there. And I'm not putting anybody down or anything like that. I'm just making a point. Because I know there are some people who are sitting back there and they know this. They know this. But if we get loose in issues like this, we'll get loose on the next thing and the next thing and the next thing until finally... <coughs> We get a different complexion of Al-Islam. But there are some people who don't know. <coughs> so there are many ahkam. In dealing with the issue, when the brothers asked me to do it, I know that they were talking about, and what they wanted me to deal with, were the issues of the masjid that we're in right now. This type of masjid. But I'm not going to do with that. Hopefully, we'll have another class. Part two, inshallah, on another Friday. If they said that that's okay. Because the masjid is so wide and there's so much to talk about. So what I want to deal with today is, first of all, when we talk about the masjid in Al-Islam, there are anwa of masajid. There's not just one kind of masjid in Al-Islam. There are different types of masjid that have been mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. And they all have their special fit issues connected to them. So when we talk about the etiquettes, there's a lot to cover. There is the obviously the Masjid Al Haram. So whenever the Muslim hears the Masjid Al Haram, he's talking about the Masjid in Mecca, the Kaaba, and what is around it. Has special etiquettes, etiquettes that have to be taught, have to be learned. Got to know what you should be doing there, what you shouldn't be doing there. The other type of Masjid that is mentioned is the Al Masjidan, the two Masjids. Whenever a Muslim hears the name, this hadith has been collected by the Shaykhan, the Shaykhan, the two Shaykhs. Who is he referring to when he says, this hadith has been collected by the two Shaykhs? Abdul Hay, who are the two Shaykhs? Al Bukhari, a Muslim. Although they're not the only two Shaykhs in the, in the religion, in the dunya. You ask someone, this hadith, Innam al A'malu bin Niyat has been collected by the two sheikhs. Who are the two sheikhs? He says, Abu Bakr and Umar. No, Abu Bakr and Umar, when you hear the sheikhain, depending upon what's being mentioned, it could be them, but
but you know they didn't collect the hadith. It's Bukhari and Muslim. When you hear the name Shaykh al-Islam, Shaykh al-Islam, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, is Shaykh al-Islam, wallahi wa rabbi al-Kaaba. He's more Shaykh al-Islam than anybody else after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if someone were to say to you, that's the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibrahim, who comes to your mind when you hear, that's the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam, who comes to your mind? Ibn Taymiyyah, good job, Ibrahim. <laughs> so the point here is, when you hear al Masjidan, the two masjids, this is not talking about Green Lane and Hartop. The two masjids, referring to the Kaaba in Mecca and Al Medina. When you hear Al Masjid Al Thalatha, the three masjids, the three masjids. They have their own special rules. Ahkam, Aidat. Talking about the Kaaba, the Prophet's Masjid, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Masjid in Bayt al -Maktas. All of those have Ahkam, and all of them are Masajid. In Al Islam, especially those of us who come from the Muslim world, like Somalia, Syria, Egypt, places like that, you have another Masjid, and that Masjid is called Al Masjid Al Jami'. Al Masjid Al Jami'. That is the special masjid that usually is closed during the course of the week. Usually. But it's the biggest masjid in the whole city. It's one of the biggest masjids in the whole city. When Friday comes, they close down the other smaller masjids. Or they don't hold Juma and the other smaller masjids. And the people of the community go to the Masjid Al Jami'. The masjid where everybody comes. It has its ahkam. From those masjid is what is known as the masjid al-khas. The special masjid. Like this masjid. Where a group of people, they come to that masjid because it's in their locale. It's easily accessible. They may pray Juma in there, especially here in Europe. But it's the masjid where they make the prayers that are wajib every day. It's the special masjid, your local masjid. Has its ahkam. We have the masjid of the tariq. Masjid al-tariq. The masjid that's on the road. Those of you who have been to Mecca and Medina, you perform Umrah, Hajj. You know when you go from Mecca to Medina or from Medina to Mecca, you are traveling on the road and as you travel, you pull off the rest, you pull off to eat. There are always masajid on the way. Masajid al turuq They have their own ahkam. Anybody can be the imam in that masjid. We're a group, we're traveling. Anybody can pray as the imam of that masjid. Also, we can have multiple jama'at in that particular masjid. It's not like the masjid al-khas where there's an imam, ratib, and so forth, so on. Then we have a masjid ikhwani that's been mentioned in the Quran called Masjid al-Dirar. Al-Ladheena attakhadu masjid al-Diraran wa kufra wa tafriqan bain al-mu'mineen wa irsadan liman harab Allah wa rasoolahu min qabl. Masjid Dirar. That's the masjid that the hypocrites, they created it. The Prophet Sallallahu he stopped in al Medina. He built Masjid Quba first. Masjid Quba first. After building Masjid Quba, he went and he built his Masjid Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The hypocrites, the hypocrites, they broke off from the masjid and they built their own masjid to spread kufr, to spread division, to wage war against Allah and His Messenger. Someone may say, yeah, but that masjid is back then. Is there a masjid in Dira right now? Allahumma na'am wa rabbil ka'ba. There's masjids in America where some women came together and they made their own masjid. Masjid al Nisa. The woman is the mu'adhin, another one she gives the khutbah. And why do they want that masjid? They want that masjid because they feel we are liberal and we have to have our own voice and we don't have to go through the men, this is our masjid. And when the men come there, they have to pray in the back. When I say that that's masjid dirar, 
Do I mean they have munafiqat? That they're outside of Islam? That you should burn the masjid down? No, I'm not saying that. And other masjid, a masjid in San Francisco, San Francisco in America is the city, a beautiful city, very diverse, a lot of Asians. And we say Asians in America, we're talking about Chinese people. They have a lot of power in San Francisco. Anyway, it's the bedrock, it's the Mecca, if you will, of the people who do the actions of they have a masjid in San Francisco. They call it Masjid al fatah Masjid al fatah And they mean something when they say Masjid al fatah Those are the masajid of Dirar. The masajid that hurt people. Because you're not calling to what's correct. And then we have the last type of masjid. And it's the one we want to talk about today. It is a masjid, ikhwani, that many people don't even know it exists. So in bringing it to your attention, I'm hoping that you brothers will implement this masjid. Even if it happens to be one or two of you are inspired to do it, so that yom al-qiyam, inshallah, we can be raised up. You and I, me, because I reminded you, informed you, and proved to you the correctness of it, and you because you did it. And that is what the Prophet called, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the masjid al-bayt, the masjid of a person's house. It was from the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he had a special place in his house where he used to pray. And it was the sunnah of his companions that they would have a special room in their homes, all of them, where they would pray in that room. If you didn't have the ability or the financial wherewithal to make a room exclusively and specifically for prayer, he had a place. That's where he always prayed. Always prayed. Radwanullahi alayhim ajma'in. And it's proven by and from the kitab and the sunnah. First of all, one of the reasons why this issue has been legislated is because no doubt having a house is from the great favors of Allah that Allah has bestowed upon us. It's from the tremendous ni'mas. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Wallahu ja'al lakum min bayutikum sakana. Allah has given you people from your homes a place to dwell in. Your homes are places to dwell in. Why did he mention that? We know that. Why was it mentioned? It was mentioned so that we will reflect and we will ponder over it and we give the shukr of Allah. Because a person who doesn't have a house is a problem. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Arba'un min as saada Four things are from happiness. You meet some people in this world, you say, how you doing? He starts to tell you all of his problems. Although he has a lot of things to say, Alhamdulillah, about. Four things will give you happiness in this dunya. And one of them he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-bayt wasi'ah, to have a wide house, a spacious house. A wide house doesn't necessarily mean your house is the size of the circumference of this masjid. Doesn't mean that. It means you have enough room where you have privacy between the boys and the girls. You have enough room where you can accommodate a guest if he comes or when he comes. You have enough living space where you're not on top of each other like it is in some Muslim countries, like in Algeria. In Algeria, during the days of instability, and they're still suffering from this right now, you'll find one Algerian family sharing a two-bedroom flat, and they're 12 people, 15 people. A Muslim man from poor countries, like India, and other than that, Pakistan, come from their countries that are poor. They go to Arabia to work. They have to share a house because he's a builder, for an example. He has to share one room with eight, nine, ten other people. That's a fitna. Arba'un min sa'ada. If you want to be happy, one of the things that helps to give happiness is having a home that you like, is spacious. Not having like some of these homes in Birmingham where that stuff is coming out of the wall, those monsters. What is that? You know that damn stuff? Slugs are crawling across the floor. Rats all over the place. You go out in the morning, the rats open up your door so you can get in your car. That's how it is in Small Heath. 
People always ask me how a small heat, how a small heat. I tell them, hey, the rats will open up the door for you. Get in your car. I know it's exaggeration, but you know what I'm talking about. Coming here today, big rat ran under our car. Just like that. Why, why is it like that? Has something to do with a navafa or lack thereof. But anyway, the point is, having a home is a ni'mah that deserves for a person to give shukr for the ni'mah. And that's why Allah mentioned it in that ayat. The Prophet said, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, in an authentic hadith, Man asbaha minkum aminan fi sirbihi wa ma'afan fi jasadihi wa indu qut yawmihi fa ka'annama hizat lahu al-dunya bihadhafiriha any one of you who you wake up in the morning, Friday, the best day that the sun came out, خَيْرُ يَوْمْ تَلَعَتْ فِي الشَّمْسِ يَوْمُ الْجُمَعَ You woke up today. Anybody who wakes up in the morning and he is safe and secure in his residence. He has a place he can sleep. He has a place he can rest. He has a place he can clean himself. He has a place that protects him and his children. And also he has good health. And also he had enough to eat just for that day. Then it's as if he's been given control of the whole dunya. No, I'm not rich and you're not rich. But you don't have to have all of the dunya to be happy. You wake up, safety and security. Not like the Muslims in Syria and Iraq and so forth so on. Problems. So all of that, Ikhwani, indication that having a house is a ni'mah. And every single ni'mah, as Allah Ta'ala mentioned in many ayat, Ya ayu ladhina amanu taqullah at-taqwa. What is a taqwa? Those ulama used to give different interpretations. One of them, and this is the point, they used to say that a taqwa is, as it relates to Allah, an yuta' wa la yu'sa. When yudhkar wa la yunsa. It is that you obey Allah and you don't disobey Him. That's taqwa. And that you remember Him and you don't forget Him. You remember Him in your clothes, as we mentioned in the class of a shama'il, the Prophet put on something new. If it's the jadda, thawbin, qamisin, imamatan. If he got something new, he made a dua. If he put on regular clothes, he made a dua. Being able to relieve yourselves. Qada al-hajj is a ni'mah. So going in, you say something, coming out, you say something. And yuzkara, wala yunsa. So how do we give thanks to Allah for the house that we have? You make a masjid in your house. And the companions, as I said, all of them, as you're going to see, inshallah, all of them, vast majority of them, they had masjids in their homes. And that's because, ikhwani, the hereafter was the most important thing to them. Their homes were small. The Prophet had the hujurat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that his wives lived in small apartments. al hujurat. And they didn't have a lot of money. And yet, in the small homes, there's a place for the masjid. Here we have large homes. In our, in our home, we have a room to cook in, the kitchen. We have another room to eat the food that was cooked. We have a room that they call the living room that you live in. We have a recreation room, a computer room. We have a room for the guests. We have bedrooms. Some people have rooms just for clothes. Another person has room just for junk. But where is the room of the salat, of the masjid? Where is that at? It's not there. He didn't know about it. It didn't exist. Because in Kalabat al haqaiq with us, the dunya is the most important thing. With the companions, the akhirah was the most important thing. So whatever their house consisted of, he is going to put a room in there to make the shukr of Allah. A place to pray. A place to make dhikr. A place to teach his Kids, the religion. So concerning this issue, we want to establish where is the delil and the proof of what I'm claiming that it is from the sunnah to have a masjid in your home. And there are many, many, many adila for that. One is the ayat of the Quran in Surah Yunus, ayat number 81 or 86. And this particular ayat in reality is talking about Bani Israel. So the people, the sharia of the people who were before us, the shara of the umm that were before us, is not a sharia for us unless proofs show. But the Quran does show that the people of the past they used to have masajid in their homes. 
Surat Yunus, ayat number 87. Allah Ta'ala commanded Bani Israel, وَاجْأَلُوا بَيُوتَكُمْ قِبْلَةً وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He said to Bani Israel, Make your homes a qibla and establish the prayer and give glad tidings to the believers. The vast majority of the people gave tafsir of the Qur'an. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for one of you to come to the masjid to learn the tafsir of one ayat is better than having a big camel. To learn the tafsir of two ayats is better than being given two camels. Three ayat tafsir is better than three camels. So the tafsir of the ayat, make your homes qiblat and establish the salat and give the bushra to the mu'mineen. Vast majority of the ulama of a tafsir, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ibrahim al nakhi Ikrima, most of them, Mujah, Mujahid, most of them, they said, when Allah Ta'ala, the meaning of this ayat, when Allah Azawajal sent Musa to Bani Israel, before Musa came to Bani Israel, they were worshipping their ilah, and their kana'is, and their ma'bad, the place where they used to worship. Bani Israel could only pray in their churches or in their synagogues. That was the only place that they can pray. But Al-Islam, Allah Ta'ala's Prophet brought a religion that is the Hanafiyyah to Samha. Ju'ilat li al-arda masjidan wa tahura fa ayyuma rajulin min ummati adrakatu salat fal yusalli the whole earth has been made a masjid for me and my community. The whole earth has been made a place where it will purify you and clean you with a tayammum. So when the prayer time comes, any man from my ummah, pray wherever you are. It wasn't like that for Bani Israel. In this hadith he said, Khamsa, five things. I was given these five things. No other prophet was given them before me. First one he mentioned was this one. Bani Israel, they had to pray in their ma'bad. No salat outside of that. And that's difficult. How can we do that? Those of us who work, those of us who travel, can't do that. So when Musa came, before he came, they used to pray in their ma'bad. When Musa came, Fir'aun destroyed all of their ma'abid and their kana'is. He destroyed them trying to get back at Musa, trying to stop the light of a Tawheed, the light of a Nabuwa, the Mishkat of Al-Khayr. They wanted to stop it in that tough way. Wahihat, hihat. So Allah Ta'ala revealed to them, Ij'alu bayutakum qiblatan. Make your homes masjids. Pray in your homes out of necessity. Out of necessity. And that's because, Ikhwani, in the religion that Allah has sent Al-Islam, all of the prophets and messengers, every community they prayed. Every community they prayed. And you can't be a real Muslim if you don't pray. You have fallen into kufr and you may be a kafir. Al-ahdu alladhi baynana wa baynahum as-salatu man tarakaha faqad kafara. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, وَاسْتِعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ Seek power, seek help, seek assistance from Allah by having sabr and, pray, and praying. If, some, if something happened to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, first thing that he would do, something happens, he goes and he prays. That's the life of the Muslim. So during their time, it was wajib to pray inside of the Ma'bud. When Fir'aun destroyed it, the religion didn't say, okay, don't pray. It said, no, you got to always pray. But now out of necessity, pray in your homes. So their homes became masajid. Now, if this ayat stood by itself, this ayat is not a delil for us in our religion. But we have in our religion what supports this ayat with too many examples. From them is what the Amir al-Muminin in al-Hadith, al-Imam al-Bukhari mentioned in his book, in Kitab al-Salat. He brought a chapter. 
And everybody knows that the tabweeb of Al Imam al Bukhari is his fiqh and his understanding, the way he named the chapter. He brought in the chapter, in the chapter of a salah, Kitab al Salah, he brought the bab, the bab, bab al Masajid fil Buyut, wa salla al Bara, wa salla al Bara ibn Azib fi masjidihi, fi darihi, jama'ata. He said the chapter of the permissibility of making masjids in your homes. And the companion, al Bara ibn Azib, he used to pray in the masjid of his home and he would pray sometimes jama' in his home, in the masjid, in his home. And Imam Muhammad ibn Yazid, al Qazwini, more famously known as Ibn Majah from the Qutb al Sitta. And Imam Ibn Majah, he brought the same hadith. He has a chapter. He called his chapter Bab al Masajid Fid Dur. Bab al Masajid. Fiddur, the chapter that shows that the masajid are in the door, and that's the plural of adar, adar, your house. This is the chapter that shows you can have masjids in your homes. And Al Imam Ibn Majah brought this hadith, and the origin of the hadith is in the Sahihain of Al Bukhari and Muslim. But he brought it with a fuller explanation. There was a blind man from the proofs. From the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. He came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, please, would you come to my house? I, uh, I can't see now, it's hard for me. I just want you to come to my house and to pray in my house. And then after you pray in that place, I'm going to make that my place of my masjid where I will pray. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam making a ta'awun, cooperating, our religion is a religion of a ta'awun. He went to the man's house. And he prayed in the house. The man made that the area where he would perform his salat. Radhi Allahu anhu. That's the hadith Al Imam ibn Majah brought because of the chapter. The chapter of the permissibility of having masjids in your homes. He brought another hadith similar to it, but it's different. And that is the hadith of Itban ibn Malik al Salimi. Radwan Allahu alayhi. This man, Itban, he was the Imam of his people. He used to lead them in salat. But his eyes started failing as well. He said, Ya Rasulullah, sometimes when it rains, where I live at, when it rains, I can't cross over to get to the masjid. So I'm stuck. I can't go to lead the people in the prayer. And also my eyes are becoming weak. So I don't want to go to the masjid like that because of my situation. Would you come to my house please and pray in my house? And the place that you pray, I'm going to make it my masjid where I'm going to pray all the time. Prophet Muhammad said, yes, I'll do it. I'll come tomorrow, inshallah. When tomorrow came, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed salat al-dhuhr in his masjid. And then he went with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. They went to the man's house. He entered into this man's house. He said to the man, where do you want me to pray? You choose the place. He said, I want you to pray right here. This is the place. So the Prophet stood there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr got behind him and the man got behind him. They prayed to Raqqa. And that became the masjid of that particular man. These two or three examples, four Dalils that I gave you, I can keep giving you Dalil after Dalil after Dalil after Dalil. Many, many ahadith of the companions. Ridwan Allah alayhim ajma'in. And sister Tabi'in took from them and did what they did. It is authentically established that they did it after. Trust me, there are many proofs that making a masjid in your house is from the sunnah. But for time's sake, and for giving you more information about the issue and its importance, we come to the virtues, the fawaid and the fadl. Why should you have a, a, a place in your house that you pray there all the time? Why would the Nabi do that? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did he just do that haphazardly for no reason? We say, Hasha lillah. Everything that he did was based upon hikmah. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُحَى From the benefits, and there are many, is that put in a masjid in your house, a specific place. Now, nah, it's okay, Ahi. In your bedroom, sometimes you put your prayer rug out right there and you pray there. 
because you're tired. You don't want to go downstairs. Sometimes when you're downstairs, you take your bread, your prayer rug, and you put it right there and you pray. Sometimes you're in another room, you put your prayer rug and you pray. And no one is going to say that that's haram. But what's better, what's ahsan, what's athbat, what's avda, is to get one single place, preferably a room. If you have a walk-in closet, if you have the space, or a place, every kid in your house, everybody in your house, when they come in, they know, this is where we pray, right here. This is the prayer, this is the place of salah. What's the benefit? Many benefits. From them is these masajid in the homes, khwani, they're part of the real life, al hayat. It's part of the life based upon what the Prophet said. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. He mentioned the hadith that's been collected by Imam al Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of that illustrious, tremendous companion, Abu Musa al Ash'ari, Ridwan Allahi alayhi. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل البيت الذي يذكر الله فيه والبيت الذي لا يذكر الله فيه كمثل الحي والميت The house, the example of the house that Allah's name is mentioned and that's general, ذكر الله The house that Allah's name is mentioned and the house that Allah's name is not mentioned The example of those two is like the example of the living and the dead and wallahi, there are some Muslims or people who claim a connection to Islam where the dhikr of Allah is not in their home at all. When they eat, when they go in, when they come out, when they sneeze, going in the toilet, out of the toilet, having relationships with the, with the, with the, with, with the husband and the wife, akramakumullah. Some khayda happens. No dhikr. As a matter of fact, they may replace the dhikr of Allah with stuff that comes from kufr. May Allah protect us. It's our job, our responsibility to make that a point. Don't leave your kid, don't leave your kid sneezing or you sneeze or someone sneeze and you don't make a big deal about it. And what I mean a big deal is to take the time out so that the kid will pay attention. Hey, we're not going to tolerate that sneezing and you're not saying alhamdulillah. Now, I'm not telling anybody to take the sword out. I'm not, it's not time for that. What I'm saying is make them sensitive to those issues. So the dhikr of Allah is general. But what's the best dhikr? Khutbat al hajj The khayr al-kalam is the kalam of Allah. It's the best dhikr. And the best dhikr that you can make is reading the Quran in the salat. That's the best dhikr. There's a lot of dhikr. Making hajj, umrah, labbaik, allahumma labbaik. It's a lot of dhikr. A da'wah Allah, a lot of dhikr. The best dhikr. Right now, I'm giving dhikr right now. I'm reminding you and we're having a dhikr. But maybe some of what I say is right. Maybe some of what I say is incorrect. Maybe someone has something that I didn't mention and so forth is not complete. But when you read that Quran in the salat, as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونَ الْعَبْدُ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدُ the closest you can be to your Lord is when you're praying, when you're praying in the sajda. So anyway, if a person is praying and he has a masjid in his house, his house is alive. It has the hayat in it. You saw the little girl running around? We don't blame that little girl because she's not aqila and she's not baliga. May Allah protect her and protect all of our daughters and our sons, our family members. She ran and she got on the mimbar as Al Hassan Hussein used to do. And if the girl were left like that by her father, it would tell us about, you know, maybe the understanding of the father. What does he understand about the masjid? The main goal and the objective and the reason why we have a masjid is for a sajda. When the Arabi, when the Arabi, the Bedouin urinated in the masjid, Taharullah Yamakum, the Prophet told me, Ya Arabi, come, come, a Bedouin man, come here. And now the masjid, Lam Tubna. The masjid hasn't been built for mankind's dirt and for their urine. Don't go in your nose and put that on the carpet. Masjid is not for that. Masjid is not for you to come here and put food on the floor and take gum and put it on the floor. He said, these masjid, he said, إِنَّمَا بُنِيَتْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ 
وَلِقِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ That's what the masjid is built for. The dhikr of Allah. So when you have that masjid in your house, that hadith goes to show the house that has a masjid and it doesn't have a masjid where the dhikr of Allah is taking place is like the living and the dead. Another benefit and another virtue is the authentic hadith that shows that the masjid in your house is khair and barakah. Is khairun and barakah. And who doesn't need the khair? And that's another thing that is a bit disturbing that if we learn the etiquettes for an example of coming to the masjid, every step that a person takes is khair. Khair, hasan is written for him. Right step, every left step, a sayyia is taken off of him. But if he comes to the masjid and his hands are like this, the Prophet prohibited that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or put in his hands and the hands of another man and his hands are like that, he prohibited that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? There are many reasons that the scholars give. The point is, a person may be trying to do an ibadah from the ibadat, but because he's not doing it the right way, or because he's doing something else, he can nullify those rewards of what he's trying to get. So the masjid and the bait, it is khair and barakah. It's the dilil. Adilla, adilla. From them is the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullahi radiallahu anhu wa an walidih. It's collected by Imam Muslim. The Prophet, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا قَضَى أَحَدَكُمْ الصَّلَاةَ فِي مَسْجِدِهِ فَلْيَجْعَلْ لِبَيْتِهِ نَصِيبًا مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ جَاعِلٌ فِي بَيْتِهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ جَاعِلٌ فِي بَيْتِهِ مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ خَيْرًا If any of you prays in your masjid, the masjid, this masjid, he said, then go back home and give your house a portion of your prayer. For verily Allah has made the prayer inside of your house khair for you. Khair. So what was the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He used to pray two rakahs in his masjid before he left his house. When he returned back to his house, he would pray two rakahs upon entering to his house. The hadith said that, دَخَلَ أَحْدُكُمْ الْمَسْجِدِ فَلَا يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يُسَلِّيَ رَكَاتِينَ if any of you come into a masjid, don't sit down until you pray two rakats. If Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left his house, he would pray two rakat. If he entered into his house, he would pray two rakat. In his masjid that was in his house. So the masjid in the house is khayr. Another, another point of that inside Bukhari and Muslim, Zayd ibn Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alaykum bis salat fi buyutikum. فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ صَلَاةً مَرْ فِي بَيْتِهِ إِلَّا الصَّلَاةً مَكْتُوبَ You people should make prayer in your homes. For verily, the best salat of a person is the prayer, the khair of salat of a person is the prayer that he makes in his house with the exception of the wajib prayer. Al-Fajr, Al-Dhuhr, Al-Asr, Maghrib, Al-Isha. You should make those in the masjid. But other than those five prayers in the masjid, the best prayer that you can pray is the prayer that you're doing inside of your house, in your masjid, preferably because you're far away from the eyes of the people. Many things can be mentioned. We're going to stop here, but we will mention the last thing. Having a masjid, inshallah, in the house, from the benefits, from the virtues, the fawaid, from the fadail, is that the Prophet, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, اِجْعَلُوا مِن صُلَاتِكُمْ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوهَا قَبُورًا Make some of your prayers in your homes and do not make your homes and turn them into graves. Because again, as the first hadith mentioned, the house that Allah's name is mentioned is a house that is alive. And the house in which Allah's name is not mentioned is the house where the occupants are like they're dead. They're like the ashabul qabur. So therefore, bring life to your house by making a masjid in it. Last thing that we want to mention, inshallah, inshallah, is this hadith, this ethic of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. It's really important from many angles, but we want to bring it for about three reasons. It's a famous ethic 
Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he gathered his students together from the tabi'een. And he wants to teach them. And as I mentioned many times, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, used to give advice and focus upon the minhaj al-sahih and giving people advice about and fitting the fitna of al-khuruj, the fitna of innovation, the fitna of ikhtilaf and at-tafarruq. He used to talk about the issues that we're, we were dealing with. You want to be on the sunnah? You want to be salafi? You want to know how to navigate? Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he paid attention to that. And as a result of that, many of the tabi'een, they gravitated towards him because there was a lot of fitna. Other companions were teaching other things. Just like him, they were teaching khayr. Fiqh of this and fiqh of that and fiqh of... And it's important. But Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he was able to get a lot of people who were trying to be on the sunnah in the right way from the tabi'een. He has a lot of statements. This is one of them. He said, Rahimahullahu ta'ala wa radwanullahi alayhi. Listen to this advice. Man sarrahu an yalqa Allah azza wa jal ghadan muslima fal yuhafiz ala haulai salawat al-maktubat haythu yunada bihinna. Anyone who is pleased and he's happy and any of you who wants to meet Allah tomorrow as a Muslim then let him protect and maintain and take care of these five prayers from where the call is being made for those prayers. Meaning the masjid. Min haythu yunada bihinna. You want to meet Allah as a Muslim and not as a kafir or a munafiq? Then when the adhan goes off, then answer the call from where the place it was made. Go to the masjid. He said, رضي الله عنه فإنهن من سنن الهدى فverily the salat in the masjid is from the sunnah of guidance when Allah عز وجل شرع لنبيكم سنن الهدى and Allah Ta'ala has legislated for your Nabi the sunnah of guidance these prayers in the masjid listen this is one of the points وما منكم إلا وله مسجد في بيته there is no one from amongst you except you have a masjid in your own home. It's a proof that the salaf from the tabi'in, they used to have masjids in their houses. And I only gave you two or three, a hadith of the companions, for brevity, for time. Because there are a lot of examples. But this goes to show the tabi'in took it. The vast majority of them. He said, وَمَا مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَلَهُ مَسْجِدٌ فِي بَيْتِهِ وَلَوْ صَلَيْتُمْ فِي بَيُوتِكُمْ كَمَا يُصَلِّ هَذَا الْمُتَخَلَّ فِي بَيْتِهِ لَتَرَكْتُمْ سُنَّةَ نَبِيِّكُمْ وَلَوْ تَرَكْتُمْ سُنَّةَ نَبِيِّكُمْ لَدَلَّلْتُمْ وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي وَمَا يَتَخَلَّفُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا مُنَافِقْ مَعْلُومْ نِفَاقِهِ وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ الرَّجُ يُهَادَى بَيْنَ الرَّجُلَيْنِ حَتَّى يُقَامَ فِي الصَّفْ I read it from the beginning. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, listen to these words, Ikhwani. He said to the people, radiallahu anhu, whoever is pleased in meeting Allah tomorrow as a Muslim, then let him make muhafad and let him protect and preserve these wajib prayers from where they are being called, where they are being made. He said, because these prayers, these wajib prayers, they're from the sunnah of guidance. And verily, Allah has legislated for your Nabi the sunnah of guidance. He said, and verily, there is not a single person from amongst you except that he has a masjid in his house. And if you were to pray these five prayers in the masjids of your homes, like the one who doesn't come to the masjid, if you were to do that, then you would leave and you would abandon the sunnah of your Nabi. And if you leave the sunnah of your Nabi, you're going to go astray. He said, I saw during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that no one would refrain from coming to the masjid except that he was a munafiq, a clear hypocrite. 
And I used to see the real Muslims. If one of them was sick, he would come to the masjid holding on to two men. And they would put him in the saf and then he would pray. So the reason why I'm bringing this athar, three reasons. And there are many reasons. Number one, number one, number one. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he established, everybody has a masjid in his house. It's the intishar of the masajid in the buyut. It was ma'roof, ma'loom. Something malmus. They were doing it. Number two, number two. Although you have a masjid in your house, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, don't make that the main masjid that you're praying the five prayers in. It's a masjid in your house. And the best prayer for you in that house is in that masjid, in your home. With the exception of the prayers in the masjid. The, with the exception of the five obligatory prayers. The prayer of the Jummah, the prayer of the Eid, and things like that. And number three, and number three, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that these prayers, they were from the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if the people were to leave the sunnah of the Nabi, they're going to go astray. And he made, radiallahu anhu, he made the measurement. He made the measurement what the companions were upon. He said, I used to see, I used to see that the only people who wouldn't come to the masjid were the munafiqeen. They're known as munafiqeen. Whereas the companions, and they're the examples for you people, one of them would come to the masjid between two other people. That goes to show that the companions, they're the blueprint. And that's why you always find this ether in those books that talk about the importance of following the companions. Those books of the sunnah that talk about follow the companions. All of those books that encourage people take the way of the companions. Al-Imam Ahmed, Sulu Sunnah. The sunnah to us is doing what the companions did and following them and staying away from innovation. This ether is in Allah Ka'i's book, Sharh, Iktiqad Ahl Sun Wal Jama'ah. All of those Imams used to bring these types of ether. It's a delil that the companions are the example. So we're going to stop here, inshallah, ta'ala, for this particular class. Hopefully, the messages, administration, the brothers who are responsible for these classes, hopefully, bi'idhnillah, they will give us an opportunity to deal with some of the ahkam of this particular masjid, the masjid that is al khas this type of masjid, or even some of the ahkam of the masjid al jami I received a text message from one of the people who are working with the masjid, Brother Ishfaq, Jazahullah Khaira. He said, can I answer two questions? First question, what is the permissibility or impermissibility of the Muslim using the masjid's electricity? Is it something that's permissible? A person, he has to think about issues like this before he does it. He can't just be nonchalant about it. Just do it. He has to think about it. Is this something that I can do or I can't do? And if I don't know, then have wara. Da' ma yuribuka ila ma la yuribuka. Leave what you doubt what you don't doubt. It would appear, and Allah knows best, it would appear that if a person, his telephone died, and when your telephone dies, you know, you can be in a tough situation, especially if you're traveling. You have to be in touch with someone. We've all been in that case. If a person is in that situation, then out of necessity, inshallah, it's no problem. Because he's in a tough situation and he came and got help from the masjid, from the Muslims. Or if a person wants to use it just a little bit, he doesn't come in at the beginning of the daras, he plugs it in for every daras or every prayer, and he just leaves it in, he's just chilling out, and his thing is going, and he's using the money of the masjid. He's drawing and taking the money of the masjid. You're supposed to give money and not take money. And if you were to take money, you got to take money from the authority, permission from the authority. There's a thing in Islam called al-ghulul. Al-ghulul. That's when you steal from the bait al-mal. We go out, to make jihad, when we make jihad and we conquer the enemy, we got this table, we got this chair, this horse, this that. You can't take that stuff. We have to bring that to the leader and leave it to him to distribute it the way he chooses. So it has fiqh connected to it. The masjid has those same issues. You can't take stuff from the masjid, stealing the money from the masjid. We had some bandit going around. May Allah forgive us and him. 
still a Muslim. He was going around breaking into messages, stealing the money boxes. And that's what drugs does, does to a person. It may turn out that that person is going to be a wali from the Oli of Allah and he assumed that station right now. We don't excommunicate him. But that deed, that action is a problem. Coming into the masjid, busting the windows open and stealing the people's monies. Where I went recently, I met a Somali guy. He has a hawala there. Oh, the brother was telling me, the Somali guy, he had a hawala. People came in and took their money and stole the money from the hawala. Seven grand. That's bad. You're stealing people's monies. But when you steal from someone's house, it's bad. But stealing from the house of Allah is a crazy, it's a crazy thing. Anyway, if a person needs a little bit, no problem, inshallah. Necessity, no problem. And the delil for that is that when the companions used to travel and they used to make jihad, proper jihad, to make the kalima of Allah uriya, and the ahkam of Allah mutabbaka fi dunya, they were making a tohi spread and khair spread, and life, they were causing life to perpetuate, not a takhrib and fasad. Sometimes, like Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, we were in the land of the enemy, Darul Harb. We came across some honey and we came across some dates and we ate a little bit from it. And the Prophet said, we didn't give it to the Nabi. We only ate a little bit. I was hungry, I ate a little bit. And when the Prophet found out about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't say you stole, he didn't say you make ghulul, which was a kabira from the kabair. In an authentic hadith, he said, the person who steals from the Beitul Mal, Yom al Qiyami is going to come and he's going to have a flag sticking out of his ist, out of his rectum, akramakumullah. And Rasulullah wasn't a person who spoke with foul language. So some of the companions, they would listen to him. Maybe the man is tired. Or for one moment, he puts his head down to roll, to rub his eyebrows. He hears that the Prophet who used to speak correctly all the time. He says, the one who comes Yom Al-Qiyamah and he stole from the Beit Al-Mal, there's going to be a flag coming out of his ist. The man is going to lift up his head and say, whoa. He's going to have fudiha. He's going to be exposed in that way. Everybody's going to look at him and say, you know why that flag is coming out of his ist? Because he stole from the Beit Al-Mal. So it's not a small thing. It's a big thing. And those companions, they ate from the honey, they ate from the grapes. And there are examples of that from the companions. So if a person wants to use a little bit of something, a little bit, then I say, you could do it. But I say, we shouldn't do it at all. You know why? Because one of those principles of Asul al-Fiqh, Sadda dhari'a, Sadda close the door before the problem happens. Close the door before the problem happens. Don't drink khamar at all. Don't come close to khamar. Don't come close to zina, fahisha. If you don't come close, nothing's going to happen. But if you come close to the hima, yushiku, and yarta'a fi, he's going to almost fall in. Stay far, far away. So I say, even for a little bit, don't use it. Because if he uses a little, he uses a little, him a little, him a little, him a little. Everybody is taking this little, 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 little. The sisters upstairs are using it a little. Everyone is using a little. After each month, that little bit that we are using from the masjid is costing the masjid two, three hundred pounds. Over the course of a year, we are putting a burden on the masjid. And the money could have been used for people who have more rights to it than us. Because it's not the money of the masjid administration. It ain't their money. It's the money of the Muslims who are in need of it. It's your money, it's my money. It's the money of the Muslims in this city, first and foremost. It's nobody's, they don't own the money. So the Muslims who are in need of that money, Muslim women who are single mothers, for an example. The kid, he wants to go to the university and he's looking for a way out. All he needs is 2,000 pounds and he can study and get his degree. That's all he needs. He doesn't know where to turn. Come to the masjid. The masjid, give it to him. Give him a debt. Give him a loan. So I say from that door, 
don't do it at all. Not even for a little bit. But as it relates to the hukum, some of the ulama said, no, not at all. And some of them said, if you need a little bit, you could do it a little bit. It's okay. Second question the brother brought to my attention is, why is it that Green Lane has gone overboard and spending a lot of money to fix up the masjid? From the adab and from the ahkam of the masjid is, you shouldn't go overboard and make zakhrafa of the masjid. Zakhrafa, zukhrafa, you shouldn't make the masjid with a chandelier that costs 20,000 pounds, a carpet that costs 30,000 pounds, some special paint that goes on the wall when you turn the lights off, the walls glow. No, you shouldn't spend no money, the money on that. That's one of the signs of Yomul Qiyama. And this is what has happened to the Muslims. In Mecca, in Medina, all over. Some of the masajid of the world, the bigger masjids, all over the world. It is um, against the Sunnah. But in my humble opinion, I don't think Green Lane spends a lot of money that's blameworthy. We gave you the class the other day, Ikhwani, and we told you, brothers, we have to be balanced when it comes to the dunya and when it comes to being too overboard or too rough and tough. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear nice clothes on the day of the Eid, on the Friday, and he told the Muslims to do the same thing. He used to wear nice robes. And it wasn't the Eid. And it wasn't Juma. He used to wear nice clothes. And he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Inna Allah jameel wa yuhibbu jamal. Allah is beautiful. And he loves beauty. That's our religion. So we have to be in the middle course. Doing things that are needed, like painting the masjid and the walls of the masjid. Look at the wall over there. That wall has wear and tear on it. It's wear and tear. It's not like it used to be. People were sitting against the wall. The time has come for the wall to be painted. Is someone going to make in card and say, you're wasting money on the paint. What are you doing? No, we're going to say, this is just the everyday normal maintenance of the masjid. Like the black lady sweeping the masjid. You have to buy a vacuum to clean up the masjid. And get some cleaner carpet. And put some stuff on the carpet to make it smell nice and to get up the dirt. Maybe... From this hour to this hour, you're going to part and off, cart and off half of the masjid and shampoo the carpet. Because for the last year, people have been walking on the masjid's floor with their bare feet. So to keep germs at bay, to keep the masjid clean, these things are part of the natural process of the masjid. As for the masjid, going overseas, getting rude and some very, very expensive oil and rude and things like that. And they pour that into the carpet on the floor. We say, no, it doesn't need that. But making the door and making the place handicap friendly, people who have special needs, this is not, nothing wrong with that. So I remember when they put these carpets in, some people, it was a big deal about these carpets. I think things like this, we have to relax. We have to take it easy. You have to take it easy. Because it's not from what is Israf, and it is from what Allah has even commanded. When the non-Muslims come to the masjid and they see the state of the masjid, that is a da'wah Allah. Don't go overboard, but make it in a way that it is presentable. How in the world are you going to interest people if the masjid has a foul odor, it's not being taken care of? And I've seen masjids like that. Messages of the people who are claiming they're on Salafi and the Sunnah, especially in America, Philadelphia. Some of those messages, you can't even pray, you want to vomit because you smell cheese all over the place. Cheese. The bathroom is not being cleaned. I don't mean that to put anybody down. I'm saying that. Don't take that as a personal attack. Where is that in our religion? At Tahor, Shatur Iman. Cleanliness is half of faith. So you can tell me all of those ulama who wrote books of Al-Iman. Ibn Abi Shaybi, Ibn Abi Shayba, Al-Imam Ahmed, you know, uh, Al-Imam Ibn Manda, I Ibn Taymiyyah, they wrote these books, Kitab Al-Iman. You can tell me Al-Iman consists of actions, what your mouth says and what your heart says. Well, from Iman is cleanliness. It's all of this stuff. 
<coughs> so we don't see that as being israf. We'll take two questions from the floor. We hit an hour's time now. If you brothers have any questions from the floor, you can ask the question. The other day, there was a hadith we were mentioning about the color green. The hadith was presented that the Prophet's favorite color, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was green. We looked at the hadith and looked at what other people said concerning it. Not only al-albani, but what other ulama said of al-hadith. And it appears that the hadith is authentic. After combining all of the narrations that are da'ifa, they help one another to make the hadith hasan li ghayrihi. So we want to take back what we said. When we said that the color green has no religious place in the religion. La kalla. We take that back. Green was the color of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if a person liked green because he liked green, then this is a praiseworthy thing. Khidr, the Prophet. Khadr, Khidr, Khadr. Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he was sitting on some uh, some cloth and it turned green because he was from the only of Allah, Mu'jiza. And that's why he's called Khidr or Khadr, the one who was green. So it does have some significance in that the Prophet liked it. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Also I forgot to mention about the Kahrubab, the masjid. In the hadith inside of Bukhari and Muslim, the Nabi saw a date, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He picked up the date. He said, Lola anni akhafu annaha min as-sadaqati la akaltuha. If it wasn't for the fact that I was afraid that this was from sadaqa, some Muslim brought his sadaqa in dates and this one fell off. It may be from sadaqa. I don't know. If he knew Ilm al he would have known. He said, I don't know if it's from Sadaq. I don't know its origin. Where did it come from? But since it could be from Sadaq, I'm not going to eat it. So that goes to show the Muslim. The Sadaq belongs to the Muslims, the masjid. Prophet had wara. Wara. He, he couldn't eat Sadaq. So he stopped himself. And issues like that, I say, for the masjid as well. Don't take the electricity from the mischief. Have wara. Unless you're absolutely in dire straits. And then in that case, inshallah, Allah is ghafoor rahim for the people who are compelled to do things that they normally wouldn't do when they're not under duress or compulsion. If you brothers have any questions, we'll give you two questions, inshallah, giving preference to our shiyukh and the kibar of sin. Tafadhi, ya shaykh. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam you stopped that Bedouin from urinating and that's a big thing obviously but he also was about to pray the prayer and he stood in the he stood up to make the takbiru to ihram and he saw that someone spit on the wall uh, facing the qibla and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took his own clothes and he wiped that off of the wall with his own clothes with his own clothes he made the tanzif and the nadaf of the masjid he turned around to the people he said, if any of you spits, don't spit towards the Qibla. Because the face of Allah is towards the Qibla. And the fact that he cleaned it up, it showed that he was making inkar. That this is not something that is acceptable. The black lady that used to clean the masjid, and she died and they prayed janazah over her. He asked, where is that lady? They said, she died last night. He said, why didn't you tell me? He doesn't know the ilm al ghayb Why didn't you tell me? He said, everybody, let's go. He went out. To the Baqir, and he prayed over her again, giving her the barakah of his salah of janazah. Although the people already prayed janazah over her the previous night, but why did he do that? Because her wadifa, she was taking care of the masjid. So don't be one of those people who 
you use and you use and you use and you don't do anything to give back. Don't allow your children to be those people who come. It's a problem. Our bathrooms. Some of us are married to wives, alhamdulillah, who are on top of cleaning our homes. When a man wants to leave his house, his wife has his shoe facing the door. He comes in and his shoe is facing inside the masjid when inside the house when he comes in. Or he just kicks them off and they're on top of each other. At some point, because his wife is cleaning that house up, she's going to take his shoe and put it where it goes and face the door to make it easy for him. Because his wife is a sahibah to nawafa. Anybody can appreciate that. Everybody has to bring that type of mentality to the masjid. The masjid shouldn't be a place where things are out of order. The Qur'ans and the masahif are all over the place. Make it your business. I make it my business. Today, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to organize these masahif. And I'll do it every week, inshallah. So that there's some nawam, because Allah loves the system. You know, the chair is here. This is out of place. The toilet, there's some water all over the floor. Let me do something about it. I'm going to bring slippers here. The point is, it's Allah's house. We have to deal with it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else have a question? Anybody else? I can't really see. Oh, 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 Abu. <laughs> You're blending in. <coughs> now, it was the position of Imam al Bukhari, the ulama of al Hadith, the vast majority of them. When Allah Ta'ala ordered in those ayat of the Qur'an, وَأَقِيمُ salat, All of those ayat, إِقَامَةُ salat, All of those ahadith. They say, إِقَامَةُ salat. What does it mean? It doesn't mean just pray. It means that that prayer has to be established in the masjid. It's not that this do you make prayer. But إِقَامَةُ salat Means you have wudu. Means you cover your awra. Means that you make the adhan means that you do the salah in jama'ah. And some of the scholars took another position, but the ulama of al-hadith, al-hadith, al-imam Ahmed, al-bukhari, al-imam Malik, those ulama, they were on the issue that iqamatul salat means praying in the masjid and not praying at home. Now, that's a good point. Okay, akhwani, we're going to stop here. Is that... um? No, that's not seen. I thought you were Saeed from here. There's a talk tomorrow as well, I think. Anybody know what that talk is tomorrow? Inshallah. It's about death, huh? So there's a talk tomorrow, inshallah, after Salat Isha, same time. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyina wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.